Welcome to another D&D Stories. I am your host, T the Writer, and this is the show where I sit here in front of a shelf full of Pathfinder stuff and one D&D book and tell you the many, many tales of me and my friends sitting around the table playing the popular role-playing game, Dungeons & Dragons. Now, today's story is actually outside of D&D from a game called OVA, or OVA which is more storyline driven and less uh, stat driven than D&D, but it's still a tabletop game with similar themes, so, you know, it still counts. Uh, where you might have a really complicated uh, D&D um, character sheet with all your items and your weapons and your money and your ranks and your, you know, your hair and eyes and weight and you know, all that kind of stuff, your inventory, what your steed's like, all that kind of stuff on your character sheet, front and back, or maybe even two sheets, OVA can condense all that down into uh, pluses and minuses. And you can basically cram all that onto one page. It makes for a much simpler game based in uh, D6s. Now, when you, like, let's say... Let's let's do a basic character. Say you wanted to make like a fighter. You might give him, you know, plus one to swordsmanship. So whenever he swung his sword in the game, he would get two dice to start with, and then because of his plus one, he would get an extra dice. So anytime he swung his sword, he would get three dice altogether and would roll all three of those D6s. Now in OVA, you get to keep the dice that match. Uh, for your total. So suppose you rolled a 3, a 2, and a 2. So your total would be 4. Or if you rolled a 4, 5, and a 6, you would just keep the 6, because that's your highest dice. When you're building a character, it's nice to roll as many dice as you can for a uh, an ability to make it more likely for you to succeed. You could roll 6 dice and not get any matches, but you could still keep the 6. Or you, know, you could roll 6 dice and get all 6s, and that would be the best thing ever. But um, you you pick pretty much whatever abilities you want. OVA covers all genres, and it's kind of stilted towards anime. But you can use it in whatever sort of genre you want because the uh, there's there's abilities like you know mech suit driving or uh, sniping. There's cute. Cute is an ability to where if you're trying to get somebody to do something, you know, instead of diplomacy or something bland like that, you can make big sweet eyes at them and they have to roll against your cute ability. So there's it's stuff like that. It's more lighthearted than D&D is, but you get the point. And then on the other end of the scale, there are weaknesses. You might have something like greedy or, uh, I don't know, pyromaniac or a weakness to a certain kind of food, or money, or women, or whatever kind of weakness that is, and you would scale it according to how bad it is. Like, if, if a woman is in the room and you can't help but just zero in on her, you might get a minus two instead of a minus one, and it scales from one to five. So, remember back with swordsmanship, if you have a plus one to swordsmanship, that means you're pretty good. But if you got a plus two, it's better, and then... Five is the very top you can possibly get to where you're just completely godlike in that ability. So, you know, if you have a five in strength, it means that, you know, nobody's going to be able to beat you in an arm wrestling match, or things like that. Or with weaknesses, like if you've got arachnophobia negative five, it means you are completely freaking paralyzed if a daddy long leg wanders by. So, 
That's basically how OVA works. And the only thing is you have to balance all your abilities with your weaknesses. So if you've got five in something over here or in several somethings that add up to five, your weaknesses have to balance that out to where strengths and weaknesses even out into zero most of the time. There's there's playing plus one characters and plus two characters, but most of the time you just you even out your strengths and weaknesses to balance out the character. And that's basically all OVA is as far as a system. And I just used up five minutes explaining that, but it'll it'll factor into the story. So the story, gosh. The story that goes with OVA that it, I've I've kind of had to sit back and let myself absorb it for a while because this this took place several weeks ago, but uh, I kind of had to sit back and absorb for a while because if I had done a D and D story like the day of, it would have been full of like shouting and frustration. So I've let myself cool down a little because the story has a triumphant end, but then it kind of doesn't. But I'll have to explain. So, the setting is feudal Japan, pretty much. Uh, Eastern style oriented game we had, uh, I was playing a monk, uh, a tiger style monk. We had uh, a golem, who was one of, it was, it was really weird. OV, OVA is a very strange game in terms of character creation. You can literally be anything. We had a fireworks maker named Carrot. We had a... Uh, a guy who was basically a Time Lord. He, he, he didn't have a TARDIS, and if you killed him, he would stay dead, but he was basically a Time Lord. He was uh, on vacation from the future. We had uh, an Ice Mage. We had... Gosh, I'm trying to remember anybody. It was, it was a big party. And all of us were on, like, the council with this Lord. And given the time frame that we were in, it was a part of history that X Lord, Y Lord, or Z Lord was supposed to unite all of Japan under one banner because this was back in the times when there were just, you know, plots and counties and little spaces of land that eventually, according to history, Japan would be united as one country. And I know nothing about Japanese history or Japanese lore or Japanese names, nothing. The the girl that was DMing this for us was knows a lot about Japan, and that kind of became the downfall for part of this campaign because none of us knew what she was talking about when we were playing in a historical setting, you know, with magic and stuff in it to make it more interesting. But we we got references to names and places that we had no idea what the significance was. So, for a lot of the characters that I'm going to describe, I can't even tell you their names, because it's like, you know, Lord Nagimasa, or Lord Metsusasodal, or, you know, j long, complicated Japanese names that, you know, have no business in a tabletop game of, of you know, the, the on-rig knotheads that we had gathered around this table. We didn't hardly remember any of them, so we gave them all nicknames so we could remember who we were talking about, because if somebody's got seven syllables in their Japanese name, we're not going to remember that. So we tried our best, and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. So feudal Japan, and we are on the council of this lord. And he's just gotten married. He's got he's got this wife, Lady Chi. She's really nice. We had a dragon, actually, too. A dragon in the party named Rushiram. And yes, that's a direct Pokemon reference, but this guy was so into Pokemon that I just kind of rolled my eyes and went with it. So we had a Rushiram there, who was... Uh, our Lord's wife's pet, her name was Lady Chi, I probably just said that. Lady Chi's pet, Rushiram, and then like five or six more party members that I just described. It was a big, unwieldy group of really strange people. When you throw an OVA game 
or if you ever throw an OVA game, give your players some like constraints as far as what they can make because that system supports literally anything. You could be a big golem made of glass if you wanted to. You know, you might have like structural weakness three or something like that, but uh, or negative three, or you know, you can be anything you want in OVA, literally. There's no constraints on it as long as your stats balance out. We made a very strange party. You know, a, a healer, an ice mage, a kung fu monk, a dragon, a time traveler, a fireworks maker. We had no business being in the same room, but sure enough we were, so... The setup wasn't very wonderful considering who everybody was, but you know, whatever. Let's get the game going. And as we're settling down to a feast one evening, we got to, you know, RP and say who we were and how we were, how we had come to be there, etc., etc. You know, my character was, again, Tiberius Tigar, uh, a man with the head of a tiger, basically an anthropomorph, uh, who, of course, does tiger style kung fu. And those of you, you know, I had to look this up because I know I knew that tiger style was a form of kung fu, but I wanted to look it up so I could role play it properly. It turns out that tiger style kung fu mostly involves the tips of your fingers. Like right here, you don't it's not a lot of punching, not a lot of kicking, but the tips of your fingers, there's a lot of like claw motions, a lot of hitting with like the brunt of your fingers. And if you go and you x-ray a, uh, a tiger-style kung fu artist, like in modern day, if you took an x-ray of his hands, you would more than likely find, like, cracks in uh, the upper joints of his fingers just from hitting hard surfaces so many times. The ends of their fingers literally become harder than the average person because... You know, that's where all the all the impact is when they're practicing. So if you run up to somebody and bust them in the head with ten points of your fingers that are already hardened as it is, that really freaking hurts. So a lot of their forward motions are literally hitting you five times for every thrust of their arms. So it's a really interesting style. And uh, I factored that into my role play. And it turned out to be pretty interesting. So, Tiberius Tigar was the uh, guardian for the lord that he served. Basically, his bodyguard, his, uh, you know, he held him as a baby, middle-aged guy. And, you know, his best friend, he, he had his lord's ear, in other words. He was, he was more than just the guy that stands to one side with his arms folded. They, it's a, a tight-knit relationship. And while they're settling down to uh, feast this particular evening, the castle is attacked by a nation right next door, uh, the Fire Nation. Which, yes, was pulled directly out of Avatar. And you're going to see a lot of references in here to modern culture and things like that, but we're going to go with it, so try not to roll your eyes too hard. The Fire Nation attacks us, and soldiers just start coming over the castle walls. How? I don't know. Maybe they blew it open. Maybe they did something or another to get into this fortress or castle or chateau, whatever. There's a name for it in Japan. Whatever they call their, their multi-leveled castles. Anyway, so the first game session went okay. We, uh, each of us had our own, like, designated rooms for, like, training and keeping up our, uh, our state of affairs. So soldiers flooded into each room, and we could use those rooms for our advantage to, uh, to fight them off. And these soldiers were nothing. I mean, they were basically stormtroopers for us to chew through, uh, to try out our characters, to see how strong they were, to demonstrate our abilities, to show, you know, we're not just a group of people you can mess around with. We were more than just the Lord's Council. We were, you know, badass motherfuckers. But, um, we went on with that, and eventually the leader of the Fire Nation, known as the Monkey King, came in to do battle with our Lord, and while we were fighting all the foot soldiers and stuff, out in the courtyard, 
the Monkey King and our Lord were doing battle. And by the time we got there, uh, our Lord had been, like, beheaded, pretty much. And the Monkey King had his had his head, like, up here, holding him by the hair. Oh, I have conquered your Lord, blah, blah, blah. And we were fighting and throwing... We, we put the soldiers into retreat. And we ended up scaring the Monkey King off because... Because, I don't know, he's... He's the, the enemy that fights and runs away to so you can fight him again later. You know what I mean. But uh, we would have overtaken him six on one. So he takes off. And we decide, you know what, we've got to gather allies and go go get him back. If you kill one of ours, we have to go kill him back. So we, we take Lady Chi with us because... You know, the castle is in ruins, there's stuff on fire, there's people running. You know, we, we turned back the army if only because we were a set of heroes. You know, we're not going to fight the entire army, but the ones that ran directly into us didn't stand a chance. So, we decided, you know what, we're going to have to go, go get this guy. And one of the fundamental things about this particular OVA campaign was that every character had a wish. And a wish was listed under your weaknesses, and if you got your wish granted, or if you fulfilled your wish, then your weakness would be rubbed out, and you could add that over into your strengths. So immediately, Tiberius Tigar's uh, wish became to avenge his lord. So the quest became, let's go kill the Monkey King, or let's go you know, let's go get him, I think we said, but we, we knew we were going to go kill him, so. We're going to go get him. So, we had to figure out a plan of attack. So, the first thing we did was go to one of our other neighbors, and I forget his name because it was a long, complicated Japanese name, but we ended up calling him the Riddle Man. And we went there with Lady Chi and Russia Ram and, you know, the Ice Mage, the Time Traveler, all of us. And we didn't know he was a Time Traveler, but you know what I mean. This motley crew goes to the, one of the neighboring states who has an affiliation with, I think, Wood. Which was what Tigar had. And this, the, the elemental system for this campaign was like dot hack. I mean, it was like... Fire trumps wood, but wood also trumps fire, so they can, if they hit each other, it's going to be a short fight. There was like fire, wood, lightning, metal, the, you get where I'm going with this. It was a weird elemental wheel, and it, depending on where you came from, it would be part of, part of this part of the wheel or that part of the wheel, and then darkness and light were over here. I hate, I hate when magic gets divided up into elements. But again, this was influenced not only by uh, Pokemon, but by, uh, you know, Japanese RPGs, by uh, a set of magic that was so in balance with itself that it kind of hurt to look at, because magic should be mysterious. It should be, you know, not so clearly defined, but yes, the Fire Nation attacked us, so we went to the Wood people to, to gather allies, because Wood and Fire are opposites, and if they hit each other, then it, they do double damage. Okay. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I was kind of caught up in the moment. But we get there, and we find out that the Lord of, you know, the castle of these this Wood-affiliated county are friends of ours, you know, and Lady Chi knows this guy who, you know, the leader, the lord of that county or whatever. And she runs on ahead of us. And when we get there, we find out that, you know, it's not so easy to go see this man because he's called the Riddle Man. And his back garden is a labyrinth. And in order to go through this labyrinth, you have to stop in front of every guard at every intersection and answer his riddle. And if you answer the riddle correctly, he'll point you down the correct path. And if you don't answer his riddle, you, you're you left guessing and you could get lost forever. Because I guess his garden is infinite. But whatever. 
So we go over there, and, and you know, there's six of us, and there some of them are basic riddles, and some of them are hard riddles, and some of them, most of them we knew already. But we answer like five or six riddles, and we get pointed down each, uh, each passageway. And we get up to this guy, and we talk to him about what happened, and Lady Chi's already there, and, you know, we would have, like, flown over the labyrinth because we had, you know, a dragon with us, and we had means to fly, but apparently we had to do it that way, so no flying for us. We find him, you know, uh, reading or something in his back garden, and we, uh, we talk to him about this, and he says, yeah, sure, we, um, we'll need to assault the Fire Nation from the sea. Because, you see, the castle where the Fire Lord, the, uh, the Monkey King, lives, is surrounded by a moat of lava. And I, I almost slapped myself in the forehead, but all right, fine. Uh, it's surrounded by a moat of lava. In order to get through it, you either have to have a fire affiliation, which none of us did, or you, you're going to have to use a great body of water to put the moat out. And since the Fire Nation sits on the coast, it surrounded itself with, like, a great wall. And if you could put a hole in the great wall, the ocean would spill in and put the moat out so you could cross it. And they said, well, how are we going to do that? That's, like, the biggest, thickest wall you could possibly imagine if you're keeping the ocean back, you know? So it's not something you could... You know, there's. I'm not sure there's any such thing as dynamite yet, and none of us have magic strong enough to just blow a hole in the wall. And the the riddle man, the 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 wood lord, I guess. The riddle man goes, "Don't worry, I know a guy." And I go, "Oh, okay. Who does he know?" And he goes, "I know uh, so and so, the pirate king." And I was like, "Oh, okay. How do you know him?" And, and he goes, oh, details, details. It's, or maybe he got a reason, but I forgot what it was or thought it was stupid or something. But anyway, we, he, he goes, I know a guy, and he'll help us out. He'll, he'll lend us a ship or a fleet of ships so we can, we can fight the Fire Nation's navy and blow a hole in the wall to put the moat out or to, to cool the moat off. And, uh, and we go, okay, let's do it. So he summons, like, the Pirate King to us via message. And he shows up and he goes, okay, we're going to go to this, you know, this island. And uh, that's where all my ships are docked. We'll go there. We'll gather up all of our guys. You know, the Fire Nation's been picking on us, too. And, you know, they don't have any any say over the water. We're pirates. Rah, we don't have to listen to those fucktards. So we would be glad to help you put a hole in this wall and put an end to the Fire Nation's tyranny. So we're like, okay, cool, yeah, let's go. Things on the boat ride did not go well. We have, uh... Somebody joined the party late who was like uh, an 8,000 pound like, golem made of diamond or something like that. You see how stupid some of these characters are. This guy in particular, or maybe it was crystal and not diamond, but the the guy that made that character is terrible at making characters. And we'll run into him in another D&D story soon. But he made, like, an 8,000-pound crystalline golem that could hover and like, control magnetism and stuff like that. So we herded him onto a wooden boat, and we had to have him hover the whole time because if he stood on the boat, it would just sink. So we had him along for the ride, and uh, we had the ice mage out on the water. So, of course, you know, anytime he touches the water, it turns to ice. We ended up crashing... What did we do? We ended up trying out the cannons, and they worked fine, and we ended up uh, crashing the boat into an iceberg. No. No. We got attacked by a Fire Nation boat on the way out, and it went so badly you would not believe it. 
we shot at them with the cannons for a while. This was supposed to be like an exciting Navy battle, but it didn't last very long. We had a Fire Nation ship attack us, and, you know, we fired cannons back and forth, and they sank, and then, you know, they started, you know, crawling up the sides of the ship, and we were fighting with them, and throwing guys back overboard, and magic was going back and forth, and, you know, one of the cannons before the ship sank uh, tagged the side of our boat, so we're like, oh, crap, and... The Riddle Man uh, from from the Wood County decides that he's going to grow a tree in the middle of the bay to like cradle the ship to keep it from sinking. It ends up shooting up so high that it lifts the boat up out of the water. And this stupid, just outrageous feat of magic—he must have rolled maximum or something or whatever—that makes that happen. Completely uncontrollable magic lifts this boat up out of the bay while we're leaving and freezes it there pretty much. The the ice mage knew we were about to sink and things were catching on fire and he's like slinging ice magic back and forth. Complete chaos. Complete chaos. By the time you know, and this is this is the party's doing. This is not the Fire Nation, you know, we're we're just complete assholes to each other the whole time. There's no reason for any of these people to be working together. And it really showed. You know, you ever get one of those one of those groups of gamers that get together that they love the game, but they really have no business working together or being around the same table? It's kind of like that. So we ended up lowering one of the lifeboats and like rowing away with a full lifeboat to get to this pirate island after we destroyed this ship with wood magic and ice magic. Just grew a tree up out of the ocean, caught it on fire, and then covered it with ice to make sure that the whole thing wouldn't burst into flames and be a beacon of light to the Fire Nation. So we got away on a lifeboat, of all things, and, you know, Tiberius Tigar is cat-like in nature, so he can't swim. He had to get rescued by somebody else. Uh, so, you know, the Pirate King was not happy with us, of course. You know, a simple naval batter, battle turned into a complete catastrophe, but that's what happens when a party like this gets together. So, we got, uh, we got into a lot of trouble that way, just because of the party dynamics were so bad. Anyway, the next day, you know, we've, we've been rowing along in this lifeboat. I'm glad this island wasn't very far away, because we took this tiny little lifeboat with six or eight people on it, and a hovering golem of, of craziness along with us, and we arrive on this island. And they say, okay, it's going to take us a while to... Uh, to get all these other ships ready since you sank the one that we came on. And we said, we didn't sink it, we lifted it into the sky, set it on fire, and then froze it. <laughs> so, we corrected them, even though we were on their home turf and completely outnumbered. And, and you know, the D, you could tell the GM was getting really frustrated because when you, when you play D&D, &D, there's a certain amount of, like, cooperation that you have with your DM in order to tell a story. You know, you, you behave in a certain way because you kind of know what's expected of you, you know? This was not a group of people that would do that. We, you know, this was a give the king a wedgie and see what happens kind of group. So, man, my nose itches. So, uh, was not, you know, the epic you know, interesting story she was trying to tell was not working out very well. So she said, you know, okay, we're going to get all these ships ready and we don't want you around the docks to screw them up. So you know what, we're going to... Why don't we send you guys on a treasure hunt? And we go, a treasure hunt? Really? And they go, yeah. This, you know, on this tropical island, we buried a treasure chest, or we left a treasure chest at the, uh, at the summit of this mountain in like a, a little lagoon, a, a pool of water at the top. It's got sand, it's, it's basically just like a little oasis at the top of this mountain. And, you know, around the table we kind of looked at each other, we said, you know, we're, we're playing OVA. 
And I go, yeah. And they go, in OVA, there's no, there's no item system. There's no inventory or money. What's the point of a treasure hunt if we don't have any of those things? And I go, I don't know. It's, it's weird because OVA has things like uh, Filthy Rich could be an ability. You know, it's, you know, Filthy Rich 1, you're well off. Filthy Rich 3, you know, you're world famous or something. Filthy Rich 5, you could buy any damn thing you fucking wanted to because you've got so much money, it's stupid. So I imagine, and I think the DM said this later, uh, if we had recovered... If we recover the treasure, one of us would get, uh, like, Filthy Rich 1 added to our character, because it could be, like, a chest full of gold. So, you know, not very appealing as far as, like, a side mission on a campaign like this, but it was something for us to do while they were preparing the ships for battle. So, rather than have us there getting into trouble, it was actually a good idea to send us out. So we trek through the jungle, and we, we avoid traps that are set up, and we, uh, we trail up the side of the mountain, and we get up there, and uh, we find the pool of water, and we, get, we find the chest, and the golem kind of goes down, plods along the bottom, because, you know, he's a golem, he doesn't need to breathe. And he picks up the treasure chest, and the bottom falls out, so we lose all the gold in the in the mists of the pool, and he comes back and he brings us the box. And it was like, well, they did technically send us here for the chest. So being the smart asses that we were, we went back down the down the mountain and gave them the box. And it was like, what happened to all the money? Uh, what money? And then they turned it upside down, of course, and the, bo the bottom was rotted out because they kept the chest underwater, so... <laughs> All the gold was still back at the top, but we bought them, we brought them their treasure chest back just like they asked. So you know, none of us kept any of the money. We were that we were that impatient with it. We didn't even bother to like scoop it all up because in OVA money doesn't mean anything. So yeah, that it was kind of a, a side mission that none of us were amused with and really never came to anything. But it passed the time. I guess. So finally, the fleet was ready. This this fleet of pirate ships, which you think would be like really big and epic, but you know we ended up getting on one ship, and that was really the only ship that mattered, because all the other ships, you know, the the next morning when we set out, all the other ships uh, set out to do battle with the uh, the Fire Nations navy so we could like sneak around the battle site and get to the great wall which is what we ended up calling it and we said okay we're gonna aim all of our cannons at blah 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 spot and blow a hole in the wall so that the ocean can spill through and put out the lava that makes up the moat even though that doesn't really make any sense because the sulfur alone would kill you but hey magic whatever so we aim all of our cannons and we blow this hole, we blow this giant hole in the, uh, <laughs> in the side of this wall, and the ocean just rushes in to put out this lava moat. And of course, you know, the ship gets dragged in with us, and we're thrown from the boat, we're flying around different places, the golem sinks like a rock, and he has to walk the rest of the way <laughs> in, into, the, into the area where we're all going. The boat flips upside down, Tiberius can't swim, the time traveler is is teleporting around trying to grab people before we all drown. Biggest catastrophe we could possibly imagine. We were like, this was a horrible idea! Oh my god! As we're getting sucked into this place. It was basically like pulling the stopper on the drain. The water just rushed and took us with it. So, you know, we should have been way farther away to blow a hole that big and for that much water to start moving into an open space. But it has the desired effect. All the ocean water rushes in over this lava moat and starts to put it out and the surprise attack begins. So the navy fight is going on. Uh, all the remaining soldiers from the wood nation and the nation that we came from are rushing over on one border and it's up to us to rush into the castle and you know grab or kill or whatever to confront the monkey king who killed our lord 
So, you know, we had left uh, Lady Chi behind at the, uh, the Riddle Man's castle, because, you know, oh, she's a princess, and she's a woman, so she can't help us, blah, 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 that basic string of thought. And we're like, okay, this is it. And we're cracking our knuckles and drawing our weapons and stuff, but of course, there's basically an army between us and the castle. And so, you know, as our army rushes over them to do battle, we've got to figure out a way to approach the castle and, you know, not get uh, just obliterated by sheer numbers. So here comes the golem rising up out of the water, and he turns his, like, magnetism on, so he he acquires, like, a hundred weapons from surrounding soldiers, and they, you know, they can't get him off, and he's made a crystal, so he can just, like, smack a bitch and hit, like, six people all at the same time. And, you know, there again, because of the chaotic way that we came there, most of the party was split up, so there's people fighting over there, and ice magic flying this way, and the golem's got 10,000, you know, 100 weapons attached to his body because of his magnetism. And I thought that uh, Tiberius and the Time Traveler were probably the only ones who, uh, who had any common sense, I guess I'm going to say. We were trying to roleplay it somewhat seriously, but... It really wasn't working, given the circumstances. So while everybody else was distracted, we thought that, you know what, maybe we can just walk up and knock, you know? So what we did was we uh, we put on some, like, clothes that we had been carrying with us, and we approached the, the Fire Nation soldiers directly, pretending to be diplomats. Now, you think that would be an interesting idea. You know, the Fire Nation is making basically a, declar a declaration of war on everybody, on all the surrounding counties of, of Japan, saying, yeah, we're going to take over all of Japan. You know, get the fuck out of our way, or join us, or be killed, pretty much. So, of course, we decided that we were going to pretend to be diplomats from a... A, uh, a county that was surrendering so we could get in to see the Monkey King directly. Uh, now, this did not work, and we were immediately captured. And it kind of annoyed me because, you know, if, if you're going to issue a doctorate, or a, a doctorate, a, a proclamation, basically declaring war on everybody around you, if somebody comes in to make, to, to send peace talks, you know, surely messengers would have uh, amnesty or whatever you want to call that. No, nope, we, we were caught and tied up and kind of like shoved to the ground off to one side like prisoners. So that really didn't work. So there's more fighting going on. The, the armies are clashing with each other. The, the, the lava moat is going out. There's steam everywhere like a sauna as the ocean keeps rushing in over this ditch over this, this 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 big moat and you know by now I'm, I'm getting tired of this because every time I try to find like some creative way of going through things other than like the somewhat railroaded path that we're going through I was like okay fine we'll do this the direct way so while Tiberius is tied up since you know he's a tiger person he uses his claws to to kind of scratch through the ropes and he frees the time traveler as well, and we sneak around while all the Fire Nation soldiers are uh, defending the castle, and we just go in through the front gate. Now, this sounds like something that could never happen, but since we are basing this around, you know, Pokemon and, you know, the wheel of nine elements that are all completely contradictory to each other and classic RPG elements, yeah, we could go in through the front door, so following that train of logic, we kind of explore the front of the castle trying to figure out what was going on, or what we had uh, to work with, and one of the first rooms we found was an armory, and I thought, hmm, well, I'm sure we'd get spotted right away if we were just going to walk around you know, in my monk gi and his, uh, I don't know what the time traveler was wearing, but his, his civilian clothes, I guess. Why don't we steal armor 
and like helmets from the uh, the Fire Nation armory. That way we could like sneak around stormtrooper style to where they wouldn't recognize us. And we go, yeah, that's a great idea. So you know, Tiberius puts on like a face covering, like a complete head covering helm, and he puts the visor down so you can't tell he's a tiger person. And they put on like regular, uh, regular Fire Nation outfits, and they've got like the shoulder pads and the the leather uh, the leather fronts armors and the the side things, the hip things, boots. They outfit themselves to look like Fire Nation soldiers while everybody else is fighting outside, and slowly making their way inside after they fight through all the soldiers. So the Time Traveler and Tiberius find the way to the throne room because you know if there's going to be a boss fight, the boss is going to be sitting in the throne room on the throne twirling his mustache. So, yeah. So we make our way there and we tug on the door and we find that it's locked. And I go, don't worry, I know a knock spell. And the Time Traveler looks over at me and he goes, really? You know magic? And I go, yes, behold, the, no the mysterious knock spell. And the time traveler face palms, and nobody comes to the door, but I thought it was really clever. So, you know, you'd be surprised how often that works. If, if you find a locked door, if you just actually stop in character and knock, you'd be surprised how often somebody just comes, unlocks it, and opens it for you. It's actually really clever. So you don't actually need the knock spell. You can just go up to a door and knock on it. Nobody came to answer. So what the time traveler did was stop time. He teleported through the door, unlocked it, opened it a little bit, stepped back through, and then let time continue. So basically, uh, like a quick time freeze kind of thing. And so, you know, we push the door open and there's a, uh, there's like a, uh, a big throne room there. You know, big, lots of columns and important-looking tapestries. And there's the dais in the throne where, where the Monkey King is hanging out. He's got his, his extending staff next to him, which if you know your Japanese lore, yeah, exactly. And, you know, there's, there's one guy, like, dressed all in black, knelt down talking to, the, talking to the Monkey King when we come in. And the Monkey King looks up and he goes... Yeah, who are you? What are you doing in here? The door was locked and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Tiberius goes, you know, he, you know, after the door is shut and the time traveler locks it behind us, uh, Tiberius thrusts his own off and I go, we're here to avenge Lord. You know, I, I even forgot his name. I don't remember our Lord's name. It was like Nagimasha or something like that. And he goes, we're here to avenge Lord Nagimasha. And the guy dressed in black turns around and he draws his sword. And he goes, Rah! And this, this big intimidation roll. And one of the things that was built into Tiberius' character was a weakness called Bizarre Appearance, which can be used for intimidation. So when this 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 black clad samurai tries to intimidate the tiger man Tiberius turns right back to him and he goes oh oh you want to intimidate okay so I, I picked up two dice and then two more for intimidate one more for bizarre appearance one more for this one I ended up rolling like eight dice for intimidate shook him up threw him Aah! completely scared this guy shitless he takes off running sorry my lord you're on your own <laughs> didn't even have to fight him and you know so as soon as that was done Tiberius rushes forward you know he, he he's throwing this armor he's running across the uh, the throne room and he's, he just makes this giant spider-man leap with his claws out straddles this guy across his lap and starts just beating his face in, tiger style, with, with the pads of his fingers. Ah! Because this was kind of the climax of Tigar's uh, 
wish storyline to avenge his lord. Remember, if you get your wish granted or if you fulfill your wish, you get extra power to your character. So there, he, he's like straddled over his lap just trying to beat his face in. And you know, he's not expecting to get jumped in his own throne room. So he takes a whole ton of damage, shoves Tiberius off and grabs his staff. And suddenly, you know, the time traveler's not a fighter. He's not going to come in and like cross swords with, with the Monkey King. And with all the other characters outside, it was me versus, it was, you know, the Tiger Monk versus the Monkey King. And because Tiberius was built to be a guardian, to be, you know, a fighting style character, it went down pretty hard. Or it went... Uh, to be a pretty harsh battle because again on this elemental wheel fire and wood are on opposite ends of this wheel so both of us would do double damage to each other so this fight was going to be really short so you know I'm, I'm, I'm really getting into it this whole campaign it's been kind of weird but suddenly we have a serious moment where it's it's the showdown between the tiger monk and the monkey king and I'm, I'm there at the table, I'm, I'm kind of sweating because I'm getting into this. I'm like, ah, ah, just like Dragon Ball Z style, going back and forth. He's trying to block with his staff, but it's really not working. He didn't have like enough dice in like the combat skill to, uh, to block all this. Because, you know, he's a lord. He's got like etiquette, he's got diplomacy, he's got intimidate, he's got all these other things to worry about. Tiberius was... A combat character with with a little bit in etiquette because he worked in a court and a little bit in a you know he had weaknesses for like bizarre appearance and uh, guardian because he had to stay with people he you know he had a you know a weakness for fish because he was a cat and you know things like that and he was built to kick the shit out of anything that he got it, that got in his way, especially one on one. So we're fighting. His his staff is extending back and forth, but he can't hit Tiberius. Tiberius is wailing on him, wailing on his face. And the other players finally bust in. You know, the golem is there, and then the ice mage shows up. And, you know, the, the fireworks guy got lost in the battle, so we never saw him again because he never came back after the first two sessions. And, you know, just, you know, complete and utter chaos is going in. Finally, the, monk, the, the GM is getting kind of frustrated. He goes, I've had enough of this! And he slams his staff down, and there's this big fiery shockwave that knocks everybody down. And Tiberius is, like, going full Kaioken on this guy. And in OVA, one thing that I, I didn't explain was uh, drama dice. You get, uh, I think, six drama dice, where if something really dire or important is happening, you can pull from this pool of dice called drama dice, to where if you just have to get something, or if you have to make that save, or if you have to connect with that attack, you've got these six dice. And they replenish, like, between sessions. Like, say you go to a game one week, you've got six drama dice, and you, you know, three weeks later you come back and you do another game to continue that story, you would get six, you would be replenished to six drama dice. So, this giant fiery shockwave comes down. It probably would have almost killed Tiberius, but I threw a couple of the drama dice into it to basically do, like, a Dragon Ball Z... Kaioken, like, wood aura, waving around him, superheating the air, splits the fire down the middle, all the other party members get knocked over, knocked against the wall, and, you know, Tiberius is just completely, in, like, impassioned, empowered, uh, you know, the heat in the room, like, around the table was, was, you know couple of us, you know, they, they tell stories about sweaty nerds. Well, during, like, this battle, it was getting really hot in the room. And I was like, ah, he, he's just going Super Saiyan on him during this, this climactic moment. And as soon as it finally gets back around to Tiberius, because remember, there's six or seven players, and 
in a boss fight. And they all get knocked back, and Tiberius is rushing up, and he's like, and it's like, I do like, uh, what did I call it? It was like the Rising Tiger Uppercut or something. You could pick names for your attacks if you want. It's like, I do like the Hadoken Rising Tiger Uppercut, like right on the bottom of his chin. And he tries to block it with his staff, and the staff snaps because I, I threw like seven dice, and four of them were sixes, and you get to keep all your matches. So I hit a 24 on this attack and his staff snaps and the fist keeps going, hits him right in the face. He goes down hard, tumbles across the room. And Tiberius is like rushes over while he's down. He's got him by the collar. And the Monkey King goes, Mercy, mercy, I am defeated. And, you know, this is the moment for Tiberius. And he go he raises up his big clawed hand and he goes, Mercy is for people with heads! Boom! And knocks his head right off his shoulders and throws the body against the wall. This dude's head rolls across the room and it's just complete KO. Thusly ends the reign of the Monkey King. So, with our victory well in hand, we got all of six seconds to uh, celebrate because suddenly Lady Chi bursts into the room. Remember, she was the wife of our Lord. She suddenly bursts into the throne room and goes, what have you done? You know, you weren't supposed to kill him. I was like, we, that was what we set out to do. You know, I got like that much time to enjoy this complete head rush of a victory because, you know, 24 you know, using like seven dice, 24, rolling those four sixes was the most spectacular thing you've ever seen in an OVA game like that. And she goes, oh my god, what have you done? You made him into a martyr. And, you know, Tiberius is like, how the hell did you get here? Just like completely like steps out of character for a second because he's, he's so like high on the rush of killing his enemy, of, of, of avenging his lord. And, you know, he's like, how, how in God's name did you get here? We left you at the, at the wood palace with, with the labyrinth and all those soldiers where you would be safe. How did you get to, to the Fire Nation? And, you know, this is where it kind of steps into railroading because you don't expect characters like that to show up because they really shouldn't be there, you know? And she goes, I, I came with some soldiers... And I was like, to a battle? You're, you know, Lady Chi, you've got healing magic, but you're, you're the widowed wife of a conquered county next door. You should have stayed there. And she's like, no, no, I came with, with these soldiers. It's perfectly fine. And I was like, no, it's not. Are you insane? You know, and you, you came to the throne room and you arrived five seconds after we killed him. What would have happened if he had been alive? He would have locked you up and, or sent you out to soldier tents to be a prostitute or to freaking, what the hell is wrong with you, you ignorant child? And just that kind of, this, this back and forth between, you know, this angry tiger monk who's still like salivating from going Super Saiyan on the Monkey King and this furious, uh lady of a court that's already been destroyed they we like gm and player basically screamed at each other for like two or three minutes while all the other players were just like watching the drama from their sides of the table so it was kind of funny uh afterwards but at the time it was really kind of messed up because she just happened to show up after we killed him or you know she she made the trek from a protected location where soldiers were under orders to keep her there, made it through the Fire Nation's defenses after we couldn't, pretending to be diplomats. She made her way across a battlefield, through a castle, and to the throne room. What would she have done if we weren't in there? You know, what would she have done if he was still alive? There would have been... No way, you know? What would she have done if she had gotten there, you know, peace talks? No. 
We pretended to be diplomats, and we got tied up and thrown in a ditch for it. So, you know, there's just this weird, this giant hole that suddenly appeared in the storyline that didn't make a lot of sense to us. So, uh, you know, the giant, you know, we, we basically cut the head off the serpent at that point, and, you know, the Fire Nation was crippled. But there was also a sudden vacuum of power, so all the other surrounding counties suddenly would have been spurned into action. And Lady Chi said that, you know, we have to make a plan. We have to do something to, uh, you know, there's going to be a, this is going to ignite a war. You know, just, just something as large as the Fire Nation suddenly falling. You know, no thanks to you, Tiberius Tigard knocking his head off with your big tiger paws. This is going to create a vacuum of power and the surrounding counties are just going to duke it out for for this land, for the surrounding uh, shoreline area where the ocean is. You know, the Great Wall is broken and, you know, all these terrible things are going to happen because you killed him. And I was like, no! <laughs> That's not how this is going to work. Our army is winning. We killed the bad guy, which we set out to do. And, you know, we won. We took over. This castle is ours now. We, you know, you know the, the wolf pack is nothing without the alpha. So, it's over, Lady Chi. It's over. But no, she wasn't having none of it. So, uh, that was pretty much where that game ended up ending was that uh, because of the unorthodox like nature of that party we decided that was a good stopping spot that that was like a chapter in history so after felling the fire nation and taking over their lands for ourselves we decided to kinda call it you know because the next thing to do would have been to like visit the lightning nation and then to visit this nation and that nation I to, you know, find out if they were friends or foes. If they were foes, I guess we were supposed to kill them. Things like that. There was this big, giant, like, elementally based campaign laid out in front of us. But we started with eight people, and we were down to, like, three or four. Or we were down to five, actually. And then we got the sudden I'm turning evil plot. And you remember the, uh, the ice wizard that I've mentioned several times? He actually created his character. And this, these are words from his mouth, not mine. He created his character on the bounds that he had made a deal with a demon to uh, be placed in Lady Chi's court for the chance to assassinate her. So while uh, Lady Chi is screaming at Tiberius Tiger and he's yelling back at her about what a foolish, you know, rah, rah, you're, you're a woman, what do you know? That's just the kind of character he was. You're, you're a woman, what do you know? We're, they're yelling at each other. And this ice, the, the ice guy kind of sneaks up behind her and just kind of taps her, like in, in the middle of her back, to, to freeze her and kill her. And then the game fell apart. Instantly. Because when we were creating our characters, you know, it was important for all of us to tell the GM all of the, uh, kind of all, all of our characters' secrets. You know, what? Remember we had to have a wish that we wanted to see fulfilled? And stuff like that. So make sure you, you design a character that your character has a wish you know, what is that wish, what is their history, everything, so she could build the world around us. He failed to tell her that he his character had made a deal with a demon for the chance to assassinate Lady Chi. She went off on him hard. Like, no, you're not going to derail this entire campaign. You why do, Why would you make a character to just to kill a major NPC? Why would you suddenly turn evil, you know, you didn't tell me anything about this deal with a demon kind of thing. She yelled at him for five minutes straight. I kid you not. It was the most uncomfortable 
like out of character. This this you know the game stopped there. This was the most uncomfortable like out of character. You know I'm sitting there kind of playing with my dice because you know Tiberius is is screamed out at this point. I'm playing with my dice and stuff, trying not to watch this because she went off on him that uh, he built a character for the sole purpose of destroying the campaign, basically. And his reasoning, again, words from his mouth, the reasoning behind this, his entire reason for killing Lady Chi, or at least attempting to, because the game fell apart, his entire reason for killing Lady Chi was to see how on rails we were. Like, how, how, how railroaded is this? Can, can you adapt the story if this character dies, or if we refuse to do this, or if we don't follow the story to do that? His entire reason for, for uh, assassinating the princess, or assassinating Lady Chi, was to see how on rails we were. Number one, that's not an in-character reason. That's, that's a meta reason. That's a, uh, why don't I break this and see what happens kind of reason. Number two, that's the most dickish thing I can possibly think of to... It's not even a revenge character. I mean, if your character dies in a really weird way and you make a character to specifically not die that way again... That's a revenge character. This was a character that from the get-go, you know, two, three, four gaming sessions back, he said, I'm going to create an ice mage, and his secret, like, wish, or his secret uh, agenda is that when nobody is expecting it, he's going to kill the main NPC of the campaign just to see what happens. Why the hell would you do that? Why? That's not fun. That's not, I mean, yeah, I understand, you know, you know, uh like it's not a good idea to kill fellow players. That's stupid or, you know, to you know, if if you go to to meet the king to suddenly shoot him in the face with a crossbow is going to wreck everything, you know, or did, remember I told you there were certain things that you do to work with the GM to work the story to, that you're, you have freedom, but you're kind of expected to act a certain way to, uh, to create the story and make it believable. You would not create a character for the sole purpose of destroying a game. That's just like, and and he's kind of he's kind of that way in games. He he builds, uh, like Magic the Gathering decks to break the system. He, he, that's just the kind of person he's not really a troll, but somebody who knows enough about the rules or knows enough about certain things that he likes to break things because he can. That's how he gleams amusement or whatever. But that was from the get go. That was just what his character was meant to do was to kill the main NPC to see how on rails we were. I was disgusted. Absolutely disgusted. If he had pulled that shit in one of my games, I would have dropped him on the spot. I would have said, no, you're out of this campaign. You got killed on the field of battle. You were never in the throne room. They never saw you again. Get the fuck out. You don't do that shit. I don't care. I, and I know, oh, it's, you know... That's not realistic if you can't PvP, or it's not realistic if if some of your if your NPCs are immune to damage from any source because they're storyline imperative. Yeah, but setting out to do something like that, that's not the kind of D and D player I would ever want to play with. It's just not. If I made a wizard and said, okay, midway through the game, I'm just going to turn and hit everybody with a fireball and take all the treasure for myself. They would fucking hate me. They would never want to see me at a D&D game again. I don't know what... 
amusement he could have possibly gained from from suddenly and if you know just if the GM had allowed it let's let's run with that our Lord is already dead so Lady Chi you know there's no children there they didn't have any kids Lady Chi was like the last hope for our like county so suppose she was assassinated then what then what are we supposed to do you know what you know I mean I understand doing things that are unexpected so the GM has to think on their feet but what could you possibly do if you work for a royal family or you know a, a, a noble house or whatever you want to call that in a, J a Japanese setting and then suddenly that house doesn't exist anymore the entire premise of your campaign is gone. I mean, even if, even if let's say, this, this campaign fell apart again, but if the premise of this campaign was to, like, kind of take over Japan and to unite it under one flag, as history says is supposed to happen, well, suddenly that house is gone. What do we do now? Do we pick another house? Or another, another group of nobles? Do we wander around? Do we take over ourselves? That's not what was supposed to happen. You know, that's not the story that the GM is trying to tell. You don't do that. You don't. I mean, I know that's like... that's like the Jedi problem, where if you're playing Star Wars, you know, if, if there's one Jedi in the group and suddenly you come up to a Sith Lord, you kind of like to see the the Jedi cross lightsabers with him because if everybody else is has like a blaster rifle in their hand, yeah, they're gonna shoot the Sith Lord in the back. But you know, how's the Jedi gonna feel about that? That he doesn't even get to whip out his lightsaber and have a duel when like when the bad guy's not looking, they just tag him and then that's it. You know, there's there's a certain teamwork, you know, that goes along with, like, cinematic quality. And it's not that you're being controlled or anything like that. It's just that there are certain limits to what you should do as a player. And completely destroying the campaign on purpose, no. Just no. I mean, it was... Not the best of campaigns, I'll be the first to say that. I was not amused by the magic system. I was not amused by the long Japanese names. I was not amused by the setting in general, but I was having fun, you know, being a tiger-style monk and, you know, kicking the crap out of the Monkey King, even though I got get screamed at for it shortly afterwards. But, you know, we started with eight players, and then we lost two, and then we lost one more. Then we, uh, and then uh, one of the main characters turns evil and tries to assassinate the main NPC. The campaign shattered. And I was done by then as well, just because of the way things were going. I mean, I conquered a boss basically on my own and got bitched out for it. So I was more than a little angry myself. And then the Ice Mage tries to pull this off, and I was like, I'm done. So, after the GM screamed him all to hell, he basically, he, uh, I think the last thing he said that was just that his character would have left then, because he didn't clear his, his origin story and his reason for being there with the GM, so he didn't get to do what he wanted, so he just quit. And then, uh, like I said, this, this, the campaign was kind of falling apart as it was, so I quit as well. But we did end, you know, after, despite all that crap, we did kind of end in a good spot. So we could consider it a complete story. Because, you know, the Monkey King came and killed our Lord. So we went and killed him back. So it kind of worked out as a campaign. I mean, yeah, you, you know, you see, like, you see D&D &D modules, or you see uh, Pathfinder modules that say, like, Part 1 of 6, or Part 2 of 3, or stuff like that. But if you picked up one of them and set it down and, and played it, it could still be a complete story by itself. It, it was kind of like that. It was basically a chunk of a larger story that if the rest of the story didn't exist, you could still say that you did a complete campaign. So... 
though it had a violent and very terrible out of character ending, we did finish what we set out to do. So we toppled the Monkey King. And uh Yeah, so <laughs> I'm trying to find a good way to spin this, but really it was probably the worst crash and burn I have seen in a long time for a campaign, because I know there was a lot more to that campaign than we had, but you know, we started out with eight players, and by the time the Ice Mage was gone, she had three people left. So, losing people every session is not a good sign. So, we did what we set out to do, so I call it, I call that a complete campaign. I call that a success. Now, we can move on and choose a different setting, choose a different story, and try again, I guess. But... That, I guess, is the end of that particular D&D &D story. So I will see you guys on the next episode, and we'll probably cover another OVA game. So I'll see you guys on the next D&D &D stories. Keep gaming.